The oldest known copy of Psalm 82 is this fragment from one of the Dead Sea Scrolls, discovered among the ruins of the fortress of Masada. Even though it's only a fragment of a scroll and somewhat deteriorated, the entirety of Psalm 82 can still be read from it. And with an infrared scan, the text is a little more visible. We're going to walk through a translation of a few of the verses of this psalm. But before we do that, we need to begin with some context. The book of Tehalim, or Psalms, is a compendium of Hebrew songs that were collected from all across the history of ancient Israel and Judah. They were probably compiled into the book of Psalms sometime in the post-exilic period. Psalm 82 has this heading, Mizmor le Asaf, which is actually rather difficult to translate due to this ambiguous preposition here. So there are a number of possibilities. We do know that Asaf was a name used in ancient Israel. And in the Bible, there was an Asaf that was a musician during the time of Kings David and Solomon. And furthermore, there was a group of Asaf's descendants that made up a guild of temple musicians that existed in Jerusalem throughout the history of the nation, even into the post-exilic period. So Psalm 82 could possibly have been written as early as the united monarchy of David and Solomon. But since Psalm 82 is essentially a prayer for God to bring his justice and governance to all the nations of the world, it is easy to see how it would have had great significance to the Jews living under the rule of foreign nations during the post-exilic period, hence it being included in the book of Psalms. There are some ancient historical cultural assumptions that serve as background to Psalm 82. Foremost is the idea of realm distinction. In ancient Near Eastern literature, we see a fundamental categorizing of things in the universe into two realms, the terrestrial and the celestial, the assumption being that both realms are full of creatures of various kinds. In the meta-narrative of the biblical literature, humans were meant to rule the terrestrial realm as God's representatives, but due to human rebellion, they became estranged from God and cursed to die. And due to further human rebellion, humans were divided up into nations by God and allotted or apportioned out to be ruled over by various celestial beings. Now, there are a handful of terms used throughout the biblical literature for these beings. The two terms that show up in Psalm 82 are Elohim, which is the plural of Eloah, which is just a general category of celestial beings. And we have the term Hasarim, which literally translates as the princes or the rulers. It is these stories of the curse of death and the curse of the division of nations that for the people of the ancient Near East, forms a mythos that explains why life is full of suffering and ends in death and why the world is full of different nations with their own languages, cultures, and gods. And these types of explanatory stories are not unique to the ancient culture that produced the Bible. They're found all across the ancient world. This notion of the nations of the world being allotted or apportioned out to various divine beings seemed to be something that was just assumed in the ancient world. Psalm 82 starts out with a setup of a typical divine council scene, just like you find throughout the Hebrew Bible. And the psalm ends with a plea for God to take possession of all the nations of the world. So this whole psalm is a prayer for God to undo the curse of the division of nations. In verses 1 through 7, we have a description of what the psalmist wants to happen. That is, for God to remove the celestial beings he appointed to rule the nations from their positions. It is like as if God was a CEO at a board meeting and he becomes angry with the mismanagement of his company, so he fires all of middle management. The offense that leads to God deposing these beings is that instead of administering justice and leading people towards God, they led the nations into corruption, increasing human suffering in the world. In verse 7, God pronounces a curse on these incompetent managers. That is, the same curse that is on humans for their rebellion. They are cursed with the inevitability of death. Now, before we translate a few of the verses of this psalm, just to get the context, we're going to read through it in the New Living Translation. A Psalm of Asaph. God presides over heaven's court. He pronounces judgment on the heavenly beings. How long will you hand down unjust decisions by favoring the wicked? Give justice to the poor and the orphan. Uphold the rights of the oppressed and the destitute. 
Rescue the poor and the helpless. Deliver them from the grasp of evil people. But these oppressors know nothing. They are so ignorant. They wander about in darkness while the whole world is shaken to the core. I say, you are gods. You are all children of the Most High. But you will die like mere mortals and fall like every other ruler. Rise up, O God, judge the earth, for all the nations belong to you. Now returning to our manuscript, here is verse 1. Mizmor le'asaf, Elohim nitzav ba'adath el, bekarev Elohim yishpot. Mizmor le'asaf is the heading, which we've already talked about. Elohim is the plural of Eloah, which is a being of the celestial realm. In the Hebrew language, verbs, pronouns, and adjectives all agree with their subject in both gender and number. And since this is the subject of our clause, and we can see that the two verbs here are both masculine and singular, we know that this noun is both masculine and singular, even though it has a plural ending. So this is a superlative plural, or a plural of majesty. In English, we can do this with just capitalizing the first letter. So capital, G-O-D. Nitsav is the verb from the root nasav, meaning to stand. It is a nafal participle, masculine singular. The nafal stem means the action is reflexive or in a passive voice, simply meaning the subject is the one doing the action to themselves. So he is standing or he stands. The adath il is the preposition be meaning in, with, or among, and adath is a construct noun meaning assembly or gathering, and el is the shortened form of eloah, so this is a term referring to an assembly or gathering of celestial beings, so divine counsel is typically how scholars will render this term. Bekarev is the preposition be, and karev is a construct noun meaning middle or midst, so in the midst of. Then we have Elohim. This time, since it is in a construct chain within the midst of, and it is in a synonymous parallelism with its synonym being the divine council, it can only be a simple plural, because you can't be in the middle of an assembly of one. So, gods. Yishpot is a verb from the root safat, meaning to judge or to pass a sentence in the legal sense. It is a call, imperfect, third-person, masculine, singular. So, he will judge. Putting this all together, we get a literal translation of God stands in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, he will judge. Or, as the Jewish Publication Society renders it, God stands in the divine assembly. Among the divine beings, he pronounces judgment. Or, as it is in the English Standard Version, God has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. Now, here is verse 7. And this is the sentence that is pronounced on these celestial beings that are being judged. Achain is the interjection, meaning something like indeed. Ke'adam is the preposition ke, meaning like or as. And adam can refer to the person of Adam or just a human. So we can render this like Adam. Temothun is the verb from the root moth, meaning to die. It is a call imperfect second person masculine plural. So you all will die. Ukeechad is the conjunction wa, meaning and, and ke is the preposition like or as, and echad is the noun, one or anyone. Hasarim is the definite article with the plural form of the noun sar, meaning prince or ruler. In the Bible, it is one of the handful of terms used for the celestial beings that were appointed to rule individual nations. So we can render this the princes. Tefalu is the verb from the root nafal, meaning to fall down. It is a call, imperfect, second person, masculine, plural. So you all will fall. So putting this all together, we get indeed like Adam you will die, and just like anyone else, you, the princes, will fall. The New Living Translation puts it, but you will die like mere mortals, you will fall like any other ruler. And the Lexham English Bible has it, however, you will die like men, you will fall like one of the princes. Now here is verse 8, which serves as a summary of the prayer that is Psalm 82. 
Kuma Elohim shafta ha eretz, ki ata tinchel bekal ha goim. Kuma is a verb from the root kum, meaning to arise. It is a call imperative, second person masculine singular, cohortative, which means it expresses a wish or a command. So, arise. Then we have Elohim, God, since the corresponding verbs are singular. And since it follows a cohortative, we can go with O God. Shafta is a verb from the root, shafat, meaning to judge. It also is a call imperative, second person, masculine, singular, cohortative. So, judge. Ha'eretz is the noun meaning earth or land with the definite article. So, the earth. Ki ata is the conjunction ki meaning for or because. And eta is the second person masculine pronoun. So, for you. Tinchel is the verb from the root nachel, meaning to get or take as a possession or to claim as an inheritance. It is a call in perfect second person masculine singular. So, will take possession. This is the preposition be, normally translated in, with, or among, but here it is what is called a be of transitivity, and it's usually left untranslated. It's just a feature of Hebrew grammar that some verbs require a prepositional phrase. In this instance, it's just indicating that what follows is the thing being acted upon by the verb. So it is the thing that is being taken possession of, and call is all, and hagoim is a plural noun with the definite article, meaning the nations. Putting this all together, we get, Arise, O God, judge the earth, for you will take possession of all the nations. The New International Version renders this, Rise up, O God, judge the earth, for all the nations are your inheritance. The message paraphrases this verse as, O God, give them what they got coming. You've got the whole world in your hands. Now, this word here, that we are translating will take possession, has great significance in the context of the story of the division of nations and their allotment to celestial beings. It is a word from this same root that is used by God to describe his special relationship with his people, as opposed to other nations. And we see it used twice in Deuteronomy 32, verses 8 and 9. When the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance... When he divided mankind, he fixed the borders of the peoples according to the number of the sons of God. But the Lord's portion is his people, Jacob his allotted heritage. And we see it used twice again in Zechariah 2.12, which describes the reestablishment of God's relationship with his people after the exile. And the Lord will inherit Judah as his portion in the Holy Land and will again choose Jerusalem. So this is the appropriate context for understanding Psalm 82. That is the ancient cosmological assumption of the world being divided up into nations that were then allotted to various celestial beings, with God taking the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as his own portion, inheritance, or allotment. So Psalm 82 is a prayer that God would remove these celestial beings from their role as rulers over the nations. This is also an imprecatory psalm, in that the psalmist is asking God to curse these beings for leading humanity astray, and that curse being the same one that was pronounced on Adam and his descendants, that being the inevitability of death. So when Jews living in the post-exilic period would sing this song, they were praying that God would take notice of the injustice and corruption in the world and correct it by reversing the curse placed on humanity when they were divided into nations. In doing so, relieve the Jewish people of their situation of being ruled over by foreign nations. They were praying for God to make a new kingdom, incorporating people from every nation. They were asking for the death of the gods of the nations, which led humanity into darkness and corruption. So this is at least how an ancient person would understand this psalm. The theology that is expressed here is this idea that God takes notice and does indeed care about all the injustice in the world, and he is angered that humanity is suffering oppression. And in this psalm, we also see that the solution to this state of affairs is God himself. Now, since the meaning of this psalm is so straightforward once it's understood in its context, it provides us with an excellent opportunity to consider a question that needs to be wrestled with. And that is, if the literature of the Bible is God's revelation of himself to humanity, 
So then what about the cultural assumption that is the context of this psalm? Can we say that that is what is being revealed as well? Or is it just being used by God because it is the cultural context of the people who wrote the scripture? Well, that is a fascinating and difficult question to answer. Now, people tend to answer this question in one of three ways. One, because God is using it, it is necessarily true. Two, God is only using it to communicate a truth, thus it is not itself necessarily true. And three, which is a more nuanced version of option two, that is, the ancient cultural assumption needs to be evaluated separate from the truth that the passage expresses. And when it comes to things that humans do not have a reasonable expectation of comprehending, then the cultural assumption is treated as true enough, meaning it may not be a 100% accurate description of reality, but it is the best as humans we can expect to get at the moment. Let's just briefly look at a couple examples other than Psalm 82 to see how this works. First, there is Deuteronomy 22.4. If you see your neighbor's donkey or ox has collapsed on the road, do not look the other way. Go and help your neighbor and get it back on its feet. The cultural assumption being that a donkey or ox is a common mode of transportation. And the theology that is expressed in this law is that God cares about the day-to-day -day sufferings of people. And if you are someone that wants to be one of God's people, you need to show kindness when you are on hand and have the means to do so. Another example would be creation narratives like Psalm 104 or Genesis 1. The cultural assumption is that the world is a disk with a firmament or dome separating the celestial and terrestrial realms, and all the creatures therein inhabit their respective domains. The theology that is expressed in these creation narratives is the relationship of humans to both the creator and the rest of the cosmos. Now, if you go with option one, well, you'll need to sell your car and buy a donkey, as well as believe in a flat earth. If you go with option two, then once you get what the authors of this literature were trying to say, then you can just ditch the ancient cultural assumptions. Now, if you go with option three, then for Deuteronomy 22.4, you can use common sense to know that the Bible is not teaching you that you need to travel by donkey. For the creation stories, if you lived in a time and place when measuring the shape of the earth was not feasible, believing that the cosmos looked like this might have been sufficient. But even in ancient times, the circumference of the earth has been known. Of course, nowadays, we can just launch a camera into space and make the observation that the ancient cultural assumption is not an accurate description of the earth. When it comes to the assumption of the nations of the world being divided up and allotted to the dominion of celestial beings, well, that one's a little more difficult to work out. For one thing, humans don't have direct sensory access to such beings. That is, there is yet to be devised a way to design an experiment that would test this one. As of yet, no one has captured one of these creatures and taken it to Area 51 so that we can dissect it and figure out how it works. Although I've heard stories about such things, I have no first-hand knowledge of it ever happening. And you have the fact that this cultural assumption is difficult to separate from the overall meta-narrative of the Bible. In the New Testament, Christ is depicted as defeating these beings and winning the freedom for all humans to be removed from their dominion and become part of a new kingdom. So for Christians, Christ is the answer to the prayer of Psalm 82. So needless to say, this cultural assumption escapes our empirical investigation. Now, each of these options are problematic in their own way, and they each lead to all kinds of new questions. However you deal with this issue, there's one thing that we, as the readers of the biblical literature, need to keep in mind. It is solidly true that to get at what the authors of this literature were trying to say, we must be aware of the assumptions held by the people who wrote it. That is its context. So we need to be aware of these things to fully understand that what is being said is the stuff over here. Once you have your feet firmly planted on that solid ground over here, then you can question the assumptions of the ancient people who wrote this literature. And you can even enjoy speculating and theorizing about things that are beyond the current reach of human empirical investigation. So in order to strive to be precise in our language, let us reserve phrases like the Bible says or the scripture teaches 
for things over here in this column. It is incorrect to say that the Bible teaches these things over here. It is more accurate to say the ancient people who wrote the Bible assumed these things. Therefore, you must know them to interpret the Bible correctly. Now, whether or not you subscribe to the cosmology and metaphysics of the ancient world, I think any remotely sane person that considers the current state of affairs in the world can be in agreement with the author of Psalm 82. One only needs to look around at the moral and intellectual weakness of those who claim authority within the institutions of government, media, and education. And take note that those who presume to rule the nations only seem capable of inflicting suffering as a result of their sociopathic and warmongering machinations. These rulers are mere corrupt maniacs that wield political sway with vain words that only trigger an emotional stirring within the witless masses. And there is the populace, which is drunk on ignorance, blinded by moral deterioration, and driven apoplectic with aimless rage. This results in a large portion of the population being enslaved, with their masters being their own stomachs or whatever celebrities serve as their avatars of lust and incoherent rage. In other words, things are just as they've always been throughout all known human history. So we can pray the same as the ancient poet that composed Psalm 82. Arise, O God, judge the earth, take all the nations as your own.